I think he's old, but I don't think that because your age, you should be uh, judged by that if you're capable to still do something. Especially as a young person, it, it, it feels kind of awful seeing that all the people in government are, you know, way older. You know, they don't really feel like you have, uh, they have your best interests at heart. Everyone has gaps, even with his speech last night. Everyone has gaps. I just want somebody a little younger because you got to keep up with the times and the times are changing. 77 is young enough, other than if he's not 81. I mean, you got to pick the lesser of two evils at some point. Those are voters in the swing state of Pennsylvania reacting to the news that President Biden might seem too old and too forgetful to face criminal charges for his handling of classified documents. That despite a special counsel investigation finding he willfully kept sensitive White House documents, putting national security at risk. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. And tonight, we are seeing more fallout from that DOJ investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents. Today has been filled with a ton of questions, like, why was that massive 400-plus page report so detailed and made public? Was it a cheap political shot, or did the special prosecutor interviewing the president actually see something concerning that he felt he had to include? Well, today, Attorney General Merrick Garland basically said after a year-long investigation, he was duty-bound to release the unredacted report. And in that report, as you've probably seen, the biggest headline is that the special prosecutor, Robert Herr, said it would be too hard to convince a jury to convict the president of crimes since he could be seen as a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Then last night, we saw President Biden hold a press conference that seemed intent at firing back at all of that, establishing that he was as sharp as ever and as capable uh, as ever of being commander in chief. But then he misspoke and mixed up the names of the president of Egypt, uh, mixed up some stuff about Mexico. Take a listen. The president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. Well, today, the White House is pushing back again, saying Biden's memory is just fine. The way that the president's demeanor in that report was characterized could not be more wrong on the facts and clearly politically motivated. And as you can imagine, Republicans in the Trump campaign are having a field day with this. And NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. Gabe, it, it seems like this massive game of memory today among journalists, among politicians, trying to remember all the recent gaffes politicians have made, the Speaker of the House mixing up Iran and Jordan, Trump confusing Nikki Haley with uh, Nancy Pelosi, the time he confused E. Jean Carroll with his ex-wife. So, so last night, what we saw from the White House, is it a big deal or is it not? Is, is Biden going to be able to move past this? Well, Gotti, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of gaffes by a lot of politicians of the last couple of days. I think why this might be important for the president is that it already speaks to speaks to something that um, polls show that voters are already concerned about, the questions about his age and mental fitness for the office. Now, Democrats today have repeatedly said that this doesn't matter, that voters will focus on other things of the coming months, things like threats to democracy, reproductive rights, that they won't zero in on this. But, Gotti, Republicans are already piling on and using the special counsel's report to really target uh, President Biden, even tonight, former President Trump at his rally making a big deal about this. Gotti. Now, one of the biggest things from this report that raised eyebrows was also the, the mention of this ghostwriter in the conversation that uh, President Biden had with this ghostwriter. Today, we heard from the White House who were kind of zeroing in on that. What do they say? Uh, yeah, Gotti. I asked the president yesterday about this, and he strongly denied sharing any classified information with that ghostwriter, even though the special counsel wrote in his report that he did so. Now, today, the White House pushed back strong, uh, strongly on that, and they argue that further down in the report, deeper in it, the special counsel acknowledges that there was not enough evidence to 
uh, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that President Biden did this. So the White House says that this is much ado about nothing, that he never actually shared classified information with his ghostwriter, that he had just some personal diaries that uh, he had written down information in. He also had a letter with uh, President Obama about Afghanistan uh, that uh, he talked about, but that the president was careful not to spread any uh, classified information uh, to his ghostwriter. And today, Vice President Kamala Harris called this special counsel report politically motivated. Got it. And keep big, big picture here. People at home, they're watching this and they're seeing on one hand, we've got this uh, special prosecutor who is choosing not to prosecute Biden because of perceptions about his mental acuity, basically. On the other hand, uh, Trump is technically looking at potentially hundreds of years in prison for classified documents. Uh, and that case, what do you think all this means for the just normal, everyday trust in the judicial process? Well, Gotti, it depends what side of the political aisle you're on. And yes, you're right. Uh, former President Trump making a big deal about this. He, of course, faces 40 criminal counts uh, regarding his case of allegedly mishandling classified documents. He, of course, has pleaded not guilty. But again, even tonight, he's making the case that because President Biden was not criminally charged, that special counsel Jack Smith should drop his case. But Gadi, I should point out that as the special counsel noted in his report, and as many Democrats are pointing to today, the cases are different. Former President Trump is accused of not just handling classified documents, but going so far as to withhold them from investigators and even getting some of his employees to potentially mislead investigators and destroy evidence. President Biden did not do that, according to the special counsel. And the president has said that he cooperated fully in this investigation. But over the next coming months, it will remain to be seen how voters will see this and wh whether they'll be able to make that distinction. Got it. Gabe Gutierrez, thanks so much. Meanwhile, over in the Senate, right after Republicans blocked what was supposed to be a massive border security bill this week, the Biden administration is thinking about ways to take action without the go ahead from Congress. And two U.S. officials are now telling NBC News the White House is thinking of taking executive action to stop some of the illegal migration at the southern border. It's a, a backup plan the White House officials say has been under consideration for months now, while Republicans are now asking, with the ongoing crisis, why hasn't Biden already used those powers? Well, Gotti, after weeks and months of negotiations, the Biden administration finally gave up hope on a bipartisan legislation solution to this issue at the border. This is something that for a long time the president has called a broken immigration system. He supported some really significant compromises that were a part of that bill that ultimately collapsed this week. So now we understand that the administration is really exploring other potential unilateral action than it can take to deter migration at the border. So this is something where the administration for months was looking at a range of options of what they could do over the course of the last few years. They've already taken some executive action as it relates to the border and that's something that typically happens with various agencies where you have DHS, HHS, DOJ involved in trying to potentially make it a little bit more difficult to seek asylum in this country but all the officials that I've spoken with concede that simply doing nothing at this point is not an option. So in the absence of that legislation that could have included a lot of new border measures that would have added more personnel, more funding and ways to really execute some of this because they can't go through that option because Republicans who were a really significant part of the negotiations and were part of every step ultimately said that they could not get behind this bill because it was connected to other national security priorities. But in the end, it was really former President Trump who came out and said that lawmakers should not get behind this legislation. So the White House now is really pivoting to the political messaging here with the president saying he's going to make sure that people know why this legislation failed and that he's going to pin the blame pretty exclusively on former President Trump, he said this week, and his MAGA friend 
friends in Congress. But that is also why they now have to come back and evaluate some other options. And we understand that certain progressive lawmakers, Democrats, will certainly be unhappy with some of the options that are on the table. But ultimately, there are Democratic mayors, there are Democratic governors who are calling the White House all the time to say that simply what is occurring right now with the influx of migrants in their cities is not working and that more needs to be done. So officials, again, that I talked to stress this isn't imminent. It's going to take some time to plan and really develop. But they certainly are saying that in this critical reelection year and with an issue as important as immigration, there just simply isn't an option to do nothing. So they have to consider now acting on their own. Gotti. Monica Alba, thanks so much. Today, a procession was held in Tennessee for a deputy who was killed during a traffic stop last night. And right now, a manhunt is underway for this man, 42-year-old Kenneth DeHart, who shot two deputies, Greg McCowan and Shelby Eggers. Now, McCowan died at the hospital. Eggers was shot in the leg and is recovering. Police dispatch recordings captured the frantic moments after that shooting. An officer down, gunshot. Two officers down, with gunshot. DeHart is now on Tennessee's most wanted list. A reward for more than $60,000 is being offered for his arrest. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us with the latest on that search. Gotti certainly is a sad day here in Maryville, Tennessee, which is located just a few minutes outside of Knoxville and we are right outside the Blount County Sheriff's Office and you can probably see the growing memorial behind me for the fallen deputy, Deputy Greg McCowan. Now, according to authorities, he was part of a traffic stop last night with his partner, Deputy Shelby Eggers, and that's when things took a, a very tragic turn. We're told that Kenneth DeHart was stopped, but he wasn't cooperating. He wasn't getting out of his vehicle, and that's when the deputies deployed a taser. And when that didn't work, DeHart, according to the TBI, began firing at the deputies, injuring both of them. McGowan was killed and Eggers was also injured, but she is now out of the hospital and recovering at home. But DeHart is still on the run. He does have a long criminal track record, and we are told that he is armed and dangerous. But we heard from the sheriff tonight. He said that DeHart's brother is now in custody. But this is an effort, a multi-agency effort here in Tennessee, and they are confident that they will find him. We're told that he's still likely in the East Tennessee region. Got him? Kathy Park, thanks so much. The five Marines who died in a helicopter crash earlier this week in Southern California have been identified. They are 21-year-old Lance Corporal Donovan Davis, 23-year-old Sergeant Alec Langan, 27-year-old Captain Benjamin Moulton, 26-year-old Captain Jack Casey, and 28-year-old Captain Miguel Nava. The crew was on a training mission from Nevada to their base in Miramar, California, Tuesday, but they never showed up. Now, the crash scene was found Wednesday in a very remote area covered in snow. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Priya Srithar. She joins us now. Uh, Priya, can you tell us a little bit about the Marines? What are we learning about them? Yeah, so all of these were very young men, very early in their military career, all between the ages of 21 and 28. We did get an opportunity to speak with three of their fathers today. They were understandably devastated. Many of them are in transit on their way here to San Diego. Uh, Captain Miguel Nava, 28, of Michigan, was a graduate of the Naval Academy, and he actually became a first-time father just four oh. months ago to a baby boy, his father telling us that his wife is just destroyed. We also got a chance to speak to the father of Captain uh, Benjamin Moulton, and he said that he got a full scholarship to the University of Washington. He was in the ROTC. He loved his country. He loved the Marine Corps. We also got a chance to speak with Lance Corporal Donovan Davis. He was just 21 years old, joined the Marine Corps when he was 19 years old. Um, his father was actually a captain in the Navy, so like so many in the military, he had you know a family history there. His father telling us, we're so proud of Donovan and all he was able to accomplish in his short 21 years. He was an amazing young man who took his job seriously and was proud to be a Marine. There are no words to describe how saddened we are by his tragic loss. We grieve for the fact that his his life ended so prematurely, and he'll always be in our hearts. We grieve with them. I, I know. Speaking of the Navy, I know you're you're in the Navy. You're a mm -hmm. Navy Reserve officer. 
one of the things that struck me about this was it almost seems like this tradition of, of not leaving any soldier behind. I know that they were found in a remote area. Can you tell us a little bit about the particulars in this case? When they found those bodies, what happened? Yeah, so, you know, it took many days to locate that helicopter in the first place, and then getting the bodies out of that site proved to be very difficult given the snow. It was in the middle of uh, Cleveland National Forest. So the commanding general of the 3rd Aircraft Wing actually said, our fallen warriors, fellow Marines, have remained by their side, as Marines do, taking shifts throughout the night at the mishap site, keeping watch over them despite the hazardous weather conditions our fallen Marines were and continue to be guarded by their brothers and sisters. So once those search and rescue personnel were able to locate the bodies, the Marines actually stood hmm. and watched over those bodies until they were able to get them out of that site. Wow. It, this, in, it's still early in this investigation obviously, but this is, this is a super stallion. I know that there's been incidents before with the super stallion. This is also, as you mentioned, like the heavy snow. This is mm -hmm. in a storm. Do we have any indication as to what might have gone wrong? Yeah, so unfortunately, this isn't the first time that we've seen incidents with the Super Stallion. You know, these helicopters have been used around the world for the past 30 years in pretty much every conflict you can think of in recent history, from Iraq to Afghanistan to Somalia. But there have been three major accidents, including this one now, in the last 10 years. Back in 2014, um, there was an accident involving the Super Stallion, and Fortunately, in that one, all 25 passengers on board survived, but they did determine that that was due to an aircraft engine. 2018, four Marines were killed yet again in a Super Stallion crash. That was found to be due to a defective part. So it's unclear just yet whether or not this perhaps was an engine failure or a defective part. But one thing that's hard to ignore is the fact that this occurred during such a storm event here in Southern California. It's very unusual. And that father, the Navy captain, Captain, uh, the father of Lance Corporal Davis, also said that we're struggling to understand the operational necessity for flying into one of the worst storms in Southern California history. You know, these helicopters are supposed to be able to travel in any sort of treacherous condition at any time of the day in any part of the world. But his question is, was it necessary for this training to occur on this day when we knew the storm was coming? So these are all questions that are going to have to be answered in this investigation. What an absolute tragedy. Priya, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. We've got a lot more ahead. Those of us here in Los Angeles, we just had a, a built a, a bit of a jolt a few hours ago. This is going to be a look at the 4.7 magnitude quake that we all felt. Plus, hopefully you don't have to block as many fake callers in the future. The FCC is stepping in to block AI-generated robocalls, and we are taking you to Vegas to scope out some of the odds ahead of the big game. And not just, like, the winning team, but what color Gatorade are we going to see dumped? Is, is Usher going to open the halftime show with, oh, my God? And our legit bets fans are starting to put real money on. We're going to show you them. They're pretty hard to believe. It's going to be the most expensive Super Bowl ever. That's all coming up this hour, so stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the stories we're following out here in the West. The West has been shaken and quaking with a 5.7 magnitude earthquake in Hawaii, then a 4.6 magnitude earthquake right here in Los Angeles. Now, the quake on the Big Island struck the world's largest active volcano, but thankfully hasn't reported any serious damage, did not cause a tsunami. Less than two hours later, Greater LA felt the shaking from a quake that hit near Malibu in the Santa Monica Mountains, and there have been no reports of major damage. Now imagine being knocked off your bed by a bullet through your bedroom wall. That's what happened to a 20-year-old San Diego City college student who was sitting on her bed studying when a bullet shot through the drywall of her bedroom and hit her in the back of the head. The victim had stitches and is recovering, but she's still afraid to sleep in her own room. Police said the bullet was allegedly fired by Samuel Hernandez, a 22-year-old U.S. Marine. He told the cops he was manipulating the firearm when it went off and has been arrested on charges of negligence. And in L.A., the Lakers unveiled the first of three Kobe Bryant statues in an emotional ceremony outside of Crypto Arena. A 19-foot, 4,000-pound statue plays, pays tribute to Kobe's 81-point performance against the Toronto Raptors in January of 2006. It opened to the public this morning, and hundreds gathered to celebrate their love of Kobe. And now on to Vegas, a city that is no stranger to big lights. But come Sunday, 
They're going to add Super Bowl to their resume with San Francisco's 49ers facing off against the Kansas City Chiefs. And it being Vegas and online betting getting bigger by the second, well, there is no shortage of odds on everything from coin tosses to national anthems. Yep, even Taylor Swift. Take a listen. Are you betting on any Taylor Swift props? There was one where how many appearances she had. And what's the the Usher prop bet? And so that's what will his first song be oh. at halftime. You can bet on that as well. Gatorade yeah. color props, courtesy of our friends at DraftKings. Of course, yeah. this has to be poured on the winning head coach. Purple, the leader in the clubhouse. <laughs> there are literally hundreds of bets just like that. According to the American Gaming Association, around one in five Americans is going to wager on the Super Bowl this year. That is a big jump from last year's game. So how did we get here? Because it wasn't that long ago that the NFL wanted nothing to do with sports betting or Las Vegas, but that all changed in 2018 thanks to a Supreme Court ruling that struck down a decades-old law that had banned sports betting across most of the nation. Today, sports betting is legal in 38 states. Now, here's a little bit of irony. Two notable exceptions, California and Missouri, the home bases for this year's Super Bowl participants. And Steve Patterson is out there in Las Vegas, probably cleaning up shop over at the craps tables since you are the luckiest dude I know with the luckiest assignment. Uh, less than 48 hours to go. Uh, what, yeah, what's the atmosphere out there and how much money have you won? I got it. You know, I don't know. There's something about the idea of slots and football that just gets me going. The atmosphere is electric. Uh, we're here right now at the NFL Fan Experience. I just want to show you this. I'm going to back up into this tunnel. This thing's amazing. Uh, this is an experience for a lot of fans because guess what? Tickets into the stadium are something like anywhere from $5,000 to $11,000. So pretty much nobody's getting in there. Uh, they have this set up so fans from all over can come out. We've seen Kansas City fans and 49ers fans. And I got a group of guys right here that want, really want me to throw them the football. I'm going to do it. There you go, guys. Let's see that um, arm. But go! obviously the main attraction. <laughs> obviously the I'll hit you guys in a second. The main attraction, as you said, is certainly on the gambling floor. It is betting, and that's what Vegas has always been about. Uh, I think they expect 23 million or billion in sales and people betting on this year's game that's up from last year even. The atmosphere for sports betting and gambling from the sports bookers that I'm talking to, they are super happy, obviously, to have the Super Bowl here in Vegas. As you mentioned, this wasn't even a thought five years ago, ten years ago, because the NFL wanted nothing to do with Vegas. Nobody even thought there would be a Las Vegas football team for the NFL because they didn't want to associate themselves or even have that inference that sports betting was any part of the league. Now they're making about a billion off of these sports books that are everywhere across Vegas, and I think the relationship is great uh, because they sort of see the revenue going both ways. But certainly, here in Vegas, we have seen it. People are very excited to place down their bets uh, on either team. Got it? <laughs> what are some of the weirdest ones you've seen so far? Okay, there are a few. Uh, obviously, everybody knows like the big ones are you bet the line, you bet the spread, you bet the total points. That stuff's like for the boring sports nerds. The stuff I really love are the prop bets. <laughs> so it's like you played a few of them, right? The Gatorade color at the end of the game, you don't know what color it's gonna be. People actually bet on that. The coin toss is another one. And then there are, of course, everybody's favorite topic this year which are the taylor swift specific ones we should say those are actually illegal unless it has something to do with what's happening on the field so you could compare how many like platinum albums she has to how many points are going to be scored that's legal if you're betting on how long she's going to appear on screen will travis kelsey like get down on one knee and ask her to marry him None of that stuff is above board unless you live in Canada, but those have to be my favorite because it's so topical and everybody can't <laughs> wait to see if she's going to make an appearance for this uh, Sunday. Got it. <laughs> Illegal unless you're in Canada. That's wild. All right, go play football with your friends there. Steve Patterson, thanks so much for joining us, bro. <laughs> oh, got it. All right. As with any Super Bowl, safety is top of mind. And even in Las Vegas, they have not seen this level of security before. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung took a look at the unprecedented measures for Sunday's big game on the Strip. Take a look. 
Tonight, the celebration is already underway for the Super Bowl in Sin City. With 300,000 fans and hundreds of parties just blocks from Allegiant Stadium, security on the Strip is at an all-time high. Good oh boy! More than 750 federal agents joining state and local law enforcement to fortify Las Vegas' walkways, waterways, and skies. To show us what they're looking for, Customs and Border Protection took us aboard this A-Star chopper. As we look at the stadium right here, there's the airport, there's the Strip. Can you imagine a more dynamic situation to find yourself in? No, I mean, you could look out the window. There's so much specifically for the Super Bowl event, but you have all this stuff that's going on up and down the Strip, so it's, it's a complex problem. Nearby, F-15 fighter jets ready to scramble to make any necessary interception on game day. We know that people are going to test us. We know people are going to try things. That security already being tested this week. He is climbing the sphere. A suspicious person caught scaling the sphere, who turned out to be a protester. The challenge is you're trying to separate the stupid from the sinister. We take it all seriously until we can rule out that it's not a threat to the community. While this may be Las Vegas' first Super Bowl, the city's no stranger to supersize events and the security threats massive crowds can bring. I would just say to you that no city is very prepared. A security playbook built to tackle any threat to the Super Bowl. Kaylee Hartung, NBC News, Las Vegas. Kaylee, thank you. And coming up, Montana is over a thousand miles away from Mexico. So why is a Mexican cartel funneling drugs into a tribal community up there? We're going to explain. But first, you got to see this. Knock, knock, caught on camera, a big old bear seen moseying around the back porch of a Washington home. That curious little fellow was no doubt after a midnight snack. He was sniffing around for something good to eat. He tried to let himself in through the doggy door, but a little bit too big of a squeeze. Back to the woods he goes. That's always a good reminder, though, for everybody else to keep their doors and windows locked. We'll be right back. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Two people have died after a jet crashed into a car on a Florida highway near Naples. Now, video shows that aftermath of the fiery crash that sent huge plumes of smoke into the sky just a few hours ago. Local officials say five people were on board the plane that was on its way to Fort Lauderdale. The FAA and the NTSB are investigating the crash. And a young teen who took police, who police say shot a tourist in the leg and fired at an NYPD officer has been arrested. Now, all this went down after an attempted shoplifting in Times Square last night, and police say the 15-year-old is wanted for two other crimes. The U.S. Marshals Regional Task Force arrested the teen today in Yonkers after a brief manhunt. And speaking of Times Square, just a few weeks ago, a large group of people were caught on video attacking two NYPD officers there. Today, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg says seven people have been indicted on felony and other charges related to the attack, and police think up to 13 people may have been involved, some of them migrants, and they are looking for two more men. A Florida man has been arrested after being accused of stealing a small plane in California. Not only did he steal it, you see it right there, he ditched it on a beach near Half Moon Bay and dipped. According to the sheriff's office, the plane was stolen from the Palo Alto airport. Luckily, no one was hurt. And SNL's Colin Jost will be this year's host of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. A comedian who co-anchors Weekend Update will have a solo gig this evening, which is usually frequented by the president, the first lady, and other government officials. Now, this year's dinner is going to take place April 27th. And tonight we are hearing from a group of women who played a role in stopping sexual abuse at the hands of a former Columbia University OBGYN. Robert Haddon is currently serving 20 years in prison, convicted of sexually abusing his patients under the guise of medical care for decades. And these women are just some of Haddon's former patients and victims. They sat down exclusively with NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber to share their stories. And we want to warn you, the details are disturbing. I just thought no one was going to believe me. I was assaulted by my gynecologist. I was molested by Robert Haddon in 1993. Two days before the birth of my son, he sexually assaulted me. What is shocking to me is how little accountability there has been. Yeah, hi, Lori, it's Dr. Haddon calling. You know, I just got word that you called the office and you're upset and you were calling the police. What, what the heck happened? What, what's going on? That's a voicemail from Lori Kenyak's then gynecologist. 
Columbia University Dr. Robert Haddon, when he left just hours after sexually assaulting her at a postpartum checkup. Please, can, can we talk? I'm very upset. I, I don't know what, what's going on. So please, if, please call me back. There was no one else in the room. I was naked in a paper gown, and here's a man that had the guts to orally assault me. All these things go through your mind. Who do I speak to? How do I get out of here? Who's going to believe me? It's my word against his. But Ken Yock's word was the truth. She contacted the police and set off a decade-long struggle for justice. A disgraced doctor will be trading in his hospital scrubs for a prison jumpsuit. Robert Haddon was sentenced to 20 years behind bars today. In the end, it wasn't just her word against his. More than 700 women came forward to say they, too, were abused by the OBGYN over the course of his 25-year career. Five of them shared their stories with us. I think at that moment I was frozen and I couldn't do anything or say anything. The way I want to be remembered is that I did say something. Do you feel like he manipulated the systems? Or do you feel like the system was set up in a way that just made this type of predatory abusive behavior easily achieved in this context? I think he picked a system where he knew he could use it to his advantage. Mm -hmm. He was opportunistic but he was methodical. Sometimes there were people in the room, sometimes there wasn't. Was he really using gloves? No. Yeah, no. Is that possible? Like, you would question it, but then he would, he would keep moving through it. In 2023, Haddon was sentenced to 20 years in prison after federal prosecutors proved he'd sexually abused patients between 1987 and 2012. The abuse was inexcusable the moment it began. But these former patients say Columbia had the chance to stop it years ago. I was molested by Robert Haddon in 1993. I wrote a letter of complaint to Columbia University detailing what he did. And the acting head of OBGYN wrote back and said, we'll be investigating this thoroughly. And he never contacted me again. In Diane Monson's 1994 letter, reviewed by NBC News, she cited a number of troubling irregularities, including an unusually long breast exam and a pap smear that left her feeling violated. I did try to speak up when it happened in the hospital, and I was just told that I was overreacting, that it had to do with me just giving birth a few hours before. If we really want to move forward from this, we need to be able to reflect on what happened, how it happened, and how we can prevent it from happening again. I shouldn't have been assaulted. I shouldn't be sitting here right now. Days after Laurie Kenyak spoke to the police, Haddon was allowed to return to work, seeing patients with a chaperone in the exam room. I would have friends call the office to try to make a fake appointment to, to just gauge how much longer they were going to allow this to happen. The next month, Haddon went on leave, and he never returned to work at Columbia. But four years went by before he was forced to give up his medical license, and four more before federal prosecutors got involved. Kenyak settled with Columbia in 2018. I was told I was the only one that's ever mentioned this to anybody. They told me, you're a single mom and a dancer. This is a lot of money for you. Go raise your daughter. The arrogance in that, as if they had done me this huge favor. More than 220 survivors have now settled with Columbia. The ones we've spoken to say it's not enough. I feel like no amount of money is going to make me feel comfortable when I walk in a in a clinic. A spokesperson for Columbia University Irving Medical Center says the institution is taking a series of actions to, quote, repair and rebuild trust, including committing to an external investigation, notifying former patients that Haddon was convicted, establishing a $100 million survivor settlement fund, and reviewing its patient safety protocols. The spokesperson says Columbia, quote, recognizes that it was a failure not to take these actions earlier and is committed to charting a new path forward. How has this experience changed the way you all approach getting medical care? Completely. For me, I think I can come with two hands the amount of times I've seen a doctor since I was 18 till now, and I just don't trust doctors. I feel like something really important for institutions to do, and Columbia certainly, to do is to educate women and girls with 
actually written material that explains this is the sequence of, of what will happen in your exam so that there's some way of knowing what's normal. In 2022, several of the women abused by Haddon lobbied for passage of the Adult Survivors Act in New York, which gave victims of sexual assault a one-year window to sue their abusers, regardless of how long ago the assault happened. But the window closed last November. There shouldn't be no expiration day on you coming forward on, on an abuse that you suffer. What would be your message to another person, another young woman? If there was a patient of Haddon and you're watching and you're listening, you are most likely abused. Reach out to us. Don't be afraid. You're not alone. There are currently at least 20 civil lawsuits that were filed against Haddon under the Adult Survivors Act. Those are currently pending. When it comes to that settlement survivors fund that has been set up by Columbia, there's a caveat there because if someone is currently filing some sort of legal claim against Haddon, or if they've previously settled with Columbia, they are not eligible for any sort of payout from that fund. We reached out to lawyers for Haddon multiple times, but they did not return our request for comment. Back to you. A powerful report. Ellison Barber, thanks so much. And one of Mexico's most powerful drug cartels has a new target. It's the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. They've been pumping fentanyl up there for months, and local law enforcement says the community is in desperate need of help. NBC News senior investigative and legal correspondent Cynthia McFadden has that report. The Blackfeet Reservation in northern Montana is beautiful and vast. It is also drowning in fentanyl. The drug problem on our reservation, it's so serious that it's uh, pretty much wiping out a generation. I'll do anything to help. Marvin Weatherwax Jr. is a leader here. As in many native communities, addiction has long been a problem. But two years ago, after 17 fentanyl overdoses and four deaths in just one week, the tribe declared a state of emergency. Would it be fair to say that you're in a perpetual state of emergency right now? Yes, we are. It's as if fentanyl is raining on our reservation. Federal law enforcement officials tell NBC News one of the most dangerous of the Mexican drug cartel, Sinaloa, once run by the notorious El Chapo, now by his sons, is targeting Blackfeet and the state's six other reservations with a steady flow of drugs, including fentanyl. What brought you up here? This man, a member of the Sinaloa cartel, was pulled over for a traffic stop on a Montana reservation. Are you from around here? Or were you, you got a passport? Mexico. Mexico? Mexico, yeah. Ultimately, he and two other cartel members were successfully prosecuted in one of the largest drug busts in the state's history, including over 700,000 fentanyl pills seized, according to Montana's U.S. attorney. So why are the cartels interested in the reservations over a thousand miles north of the Mexican border? Profits are just out of this world. Until a couple of months ago, Stacy Zinn ran the DEA here in Montana. She tells me on the reservations, the price of fentanyl is high and law enforcement is sparse. Fertile ground for the cartel. Drugs in other cities are saturated. You have multiple cartels. Well, up here in Montana, it's pretty much wide open space and territory for them to be able to grab. Profit margins soar the further away from the Mexican border you go. A single fentanyl pill that costs between 4 and 25 cents to produce in Mexico can be sold for 50 cents to a dollar in San Diego and over $100 on some reservations here in Montana. And then there's the lack of law enforcement. According to a former federal official, there are less than 20 DEA agents for the whole state. As for the reservations... These reservations don't have enough tribal police to protect them. Nefarious people, the ones that are committing crimes, know this. On the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, the boarded up meth houses bear witness to what community leaders say is a staggering drug problem. Two years ago, there were only 19 police officers for the whole reservation. So the tribe sued the Bureau of Indian Affairs asking for help, but no help arrived. They are now down to seven officers. I was very frustrated about it. Tribal leaders say the effects are devastating. Have you seen a spike in other kinds of crime? Sexual abuse and sexual assault. Human trafficking. Child neglect. 
While the Bureau of Indian Affairs tells us they don't comment on pending cases, Zinn insists more resources are urgently needed. We are fighting this problem standing on one leg and half the time we're handcuffed. She says right now the cartels are winning. Cynthia McFadden, NBC News, Montana. Cynthia, thank you for that report. And still to come, Prince Harry just settled a phone hacking lawsuit against a British tabloid. That story and others coming up next. Hey there, let's take a look around the world in 60 seconds. The U.S. has announced it's conducted a new round of airstrikes targeting Houthi rebels in Yemen. Four Houthi drone boats and seven missile launchers were destroyed in those airstrikes. American forces say they were a threat to U.S. Navy ships in the area. Voters in Pakistan are waiting for the final results of a surprisingly close general election. The jailed Prime Minister Imran Khan and his allies have seen strong turnout from supporters. Now, rival opposition leader Nawaz Sharif, another former leader, was expecting a landslide win after the military there cracked down on Khan's party. The region has seen widespread violence leading up to the election, and Khan, who's been jailed since August, has been releasing AI videos claiming victories. Prince Harry has settled a lawsuit against a British newspaper that invaded his privacy through phone hacking. The judge ordered the Mirror Group newspapers to pay Harry half a million dollars in costs and damages. The phone hacking and illegal snooping allegedly took place in the late 1990s and went on for more than a decade. Harry vowed to continue to seek justice against the British press, and he has a similar ongoing case against The Sun and The Daily Mail. The International Skating Union is standing by its decision to award the bronze medal from the 2022 Beijing Olympics to the Russian figure skating team. Now, the group had reshuffled placings from the competition last month following a doping scandal that disqualified Russian team member Kamila, Kamila, Kamila Vilieva. The decision drew controversy after the ISU declined, or declined to boost the placements of athletes who finished below Vilieva. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is warning his troops to prepare for a civilian evacuation out of Rafah ahead of a ground invasion. That is one of the southernmost cities in Gaza where more than a million Palestinians are now sheltering. NBC's foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us from Israel. We've heard from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's instructed the Israeli Defense Forces, Israel's military, to come up with a plan to evacuate the remaining civilians from the town of Rafa. That is the most extreme southern town of the Gaza Strip. And it really is the only place in the Gaza Strip that the Israeli military hasn't launched an incursion into and hasn't almost completely destroyed, as we've seen has, it's done through so much of the rest of the Gaza Strip. And there's thought to be about 1.5 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. This, according to various estimates by various aid agencies in the United Nations. But this is, again, a population of people, almost all of whom have been displaced from elsewhere in the Gaza Strip. Some of them have been displaced more than one, two or three times. And this is the place where the Israelis said those Palestinians could seek some form of safety. Well, now it looks like the Israelis are now bombing that city, that town. And it looks like they're about to start a ground invasion of this place, a place where people had gone for refuge. Now, all of this is happening. This looks like gearing up for a final assault on the final place in the Gaza Strip that hasn't been hit very hard by the Israelis. It's happening as it looks as though the Biden administration is trying to redouble its efforts to try to get a hostage deal over the line. Axios is reporting CIA chief Bill Burns is maybe about to head to Cairo. And that's where we've heard that Hamas leaders are huddling, trying to talk about potential negotiations for a hostage release in exchange for the release of Palestinians held in Israeli prisoners and also for a prolonged uh, pause in the fighting. Now, this had been reached before. In Paris, there was a deal that Bill Burns also was negotiating. About two weeks ago, this came up with a proposal that was essentially kind of rejected by Hamas. They asked for more. They wanted a longer pause in the fighting. And they wanted more guarantees that the Israeli military would withdraw from the Gaza Strip. The Israelis, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu himself, said that this was a non-starter. He even called it delusional just a couple of days ago. Well, now it looks like the Biden administration still is holding out hope that Hamas and Israel will come to some sort of agreement to free those more than 100 remaining hostages and maybe bring this war at least to a pause, maybe, finally, to an end.
Matt Bradley, thanks so much. And tomorrow is the official start of the Lunar New Year, and a record number of people are expected to travel across China to celebrate the Year of the Dragon. Now, officials are hoping those festivities will help revive the country's economy that's been slipping in recent months. And NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackie Freyer was on the streets in Beijing as the celebrations kicked off. The biggest holiday event of the year, the Lunar New Year. It kicks off February 10th with festivities that can last up to two weeks. Millions of people across Asia and around the world are celebrating the year of the dragon. Uh, here in China, it's known as the Spring Festival, and it triggers a mass migration as hundreds of millions of people travel to their hometowns for the holidays. A 40-day long travel surge. This year, a record number of flights and trains had to be added to accommodate demand for people wanting to get somewhere. Weather made it tricky early Earlier in the week with freezing rain and snow that hit parts of central China and forced a lot of cancellations. The holidays come at a time when China's economy is showing signs of slowing down with rising unemployment and plunging prices. Uh, there have been steep declines in the stock market in recent weeks as well as concerns about the property crisis. The hope here is that a dragon year will breathe some fire into the economy. Officials say that consumer spending is going to be a key driver for growth. For the New Year period, cities and homes are decorated with red lanterns and other traditional symbols meant to bring luck, health and prosperity. There are family get-togethers, always a lot of food and a list of auspicious do's and don'ts like do wear red but don't wash your hair on New Year's Day because that's going to wash away your luck. So Xinyi and Kuala, wherever you're celebrating, have a happy Year of the Dragon. Janice Mackie Freyer rocking that red scarf. Janice, thanks so much. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. If you are sick of getting spam calls every single day, we might have some good news for you. The FCC is banning AI-generated robocalls, so no more fake calls from politicians. We're going to take a closer look, so stay tuned. the value of voting Democratic when our votes count. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. We'll need your help in electing Democrats up and down the ticket. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. Your vote makes a difference in November, not this Tuesday. Yeah, that recording you just heard wasn't actually President Biden. It was a fake robocall generated by AI. And now the FCC is cracking down on calls like that. The agency says they are banning those artificial calls. And they're talking about the ones that use voice cloning, where it sounds like you're getting a call from a celebrity or maybe even somebody that you know. And the ruling is giving state new tools to go after bad actors. And the ruling is sending a pretty clear message that using the tech to scam people and even mislead voters won't be tolerated. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung has more details. Hey, Gotti, well, a really fascinating move by the Federal Communications Commission yesterday, which banned outright the use of artificial intelligence in robocalls. And this is really important, especially after some NBC News exclusive reporting not long ago that in New Hampshire, there were AI calls of President Biden that were being used to discourage voters ahead of the primary there. Uh, we've also seen other applications of this in previous elections. Uh, in the 2020 election, there were robocalls that were put out by conservative figures that were trying to uh, scare black voters into wrongly thinking that if they went out and voted, uh, they would be uh, reported to the credit reporting agencies or uh, police and law enforcement. Uh, these types of calls have been very, very scary. And even at a personal level, outside of the election application, uh, there would be instances where perhaps AI could be used to simulate a loved one or a family member to you. So the FCC through, by the way, a authority that they already have through a 1991 law known as the uh, Telecommunications Consumer Protection Act are saying, look, we are going to go after anyone that that's using AI in either a marketing or a political application, but obviously all of this really key ahead of what's going to be a very, very big presidential election later on this year, Gotti. Brian, thanks so much. Now, how is it that most of our world is covered in water and yet what is beneath our oceans is still one of the Earth's greatest mysteries? Well, now instead of diving deep below, scientists are looking up for answers and we are talking way up, like in space. 
Climate reporter Chase Kane tells us what NASA's newest satellite, PACE, is hoping to accomplish. Two, one, booster ignition. Four power engines and liftoff of the Falcon 9 and PACE. Launching in the early morning hours, NASA's PACE satellite will orbit Earth in sync with the sun so that the sun is always at its back for the best view of Earth. PACE is an acronym for what the satellite will help us learn more about. Plankton, small plants and algae in the ocean. Aerosols, tiny particles from things like wildfires and pollution. Clouds and how they reflect or scatter incoming sunlight and ocean ecosystems. Simply put, this satellite is gonna help us see tiny things a lot better. And those tiny things have a big influence on the way that our planet responds to the climate change that humans are driving by burning coal, oil, and gas. Imagine right now, scientists can only see with a few colors. Pace will be like adding hundreds of colors, giving a full spectrum view of plankton and aerosols. So think about moving to a bigger box of crayons um, with more colors there. So darker particles will uh, absorb sunlight, lighter particles will reflect it. How clouds form and where they form depend in part on that. What we're trying to better understand with Pace is the different types of aerosols. So, you know, there's sea salt, there's smoke, there's mineral dust, and all of this will better understand that and how it translates into clouds. And then there are the dreams that many scientists dare speak out loud. The things that this satellite might be able to do beyond what it was designed to do. You might have heard of an instrument called EMIT that we put on the International Space Station a couple of years ago. It was designed to measure mineral dust, which is another kind of these tiny particles that reflect or absorb sunlight. But the science team figured out how to measure methane with it, and we're now able to identify methane methane super emitters. And so we know, you know, what PACE was designed for, and we're really excited about that. But I, you never know what NASA scientists and engineers will be able to figure out what to do next. In Washington, I am national climate reporter Chase Kane. And finally tonight, for those of you who may have been wondering where I disappeared to over the last three months, well, I want to share my little future of everything right here. You see, back in October, I was sitting right here in this very studio when my wife called three weeks before our due date. The next thing we know, that little Rio Tadashi, he's here. He's made us a family of four. For me, it has felt like a blink of an eye. But for Rio, it has been a whole lifetime. And I am so incredibly grateful for every second with Rio, with my wife Kimmy, with our little Dynamo Kira over here who can continue every single day to inspire so much optimism for this crazy world. So huge thanks to NBC for such a wonderful parental leave program. And thank you to my friends who saw uh, us here filling in over the last few months. They made it all possible. Ellison, Sam, Jake, Val, Stephen, my bosses, Polly, Janelle, Caesar, Lisa, thank you so very much. That's it from us Schwartzies tonight. Uh, we'll be back on Monday, but until then, can you say, can you say stay tuned now? Stay tuned now. Stay tuned now. <laughs>